So I will get started. I'm uh, Dr. Emma Robertson. I am the History Programme Coordinator at The Trove. And I'd like to begin our online Discovering History seminar by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we're all living and working. I think probably many of us are beaming in from beautiful Jara country in Bendigo. Um, but people may be joining us from elsewhere around Australia, maybe even overseas. That's the wonders of Zoom. Um, I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present and to especially welcome any First Nations people that are joining us today. If you'd like to add your own acknowledgement in the chat, uh, you're also very welcome to do that as well. So as I say, welcome to our Discovering History seminar. Um, <clears throat> this is run as a collaboration between La Trobe University, the Bendigo Regional Archive Centre, the Goldfields Library, and the Golden Dragon Museum in Bendigo. Um, I'm, my name's Emma and I'm based at Bendigo campus in the history programme, and I'm um, filling in today for Dr. Ruth Ford, who, as many of you may know, has put together a really fantastic um, programme for discovering history this semester, this <laughs> season. <laughs> um, so yeah, thanks very much to Ruth, um, who's not with us today. Um, <clears throat> it's very disappointing that we couldn't meet at the library, those of us in the regions uh, looking forward to midnight tonight when a few restrictions are easing, but uh, the wonders of Zoom make it possible for us to join together, which is really fantastic. Um, and it's a real great pleasure to welcome another Bendigo campus colleague, uh, Dr. Wayne Murdoch from the La Trobe Rural Health School. And I think we've got a few rural health colleagues here. Although based in rural health, Wayne is an active and published historian. Uh, he has two books, one uh, Camp Melbourne in the 1920s and 30s, uh, Trade, Queens and Inverts, and then a second book, which will be the focus of today's paper, The Mystery of the Handsome Man, The Double Life of John Lempriere Irvine. I might have said that wrong in my Yorkshire tones. Um, yeah, and as I said, this second, paper, second book that will really be the focus today. So. Without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Wayne uh, for his presentation. Uh, Wayne will speak for about 40 minutes and then we'll have 20 minutes at the end for questions. Um, I look forward to hearing from you. Uh, just a reminder, we'll put those questions into the chat, um, which is uh, yeah, really the best way for our YouTube broadcasting uh, afterwards. So yeah, thanks. Over to you, Wayne. Fantastic. Thank you, Emma. Can everybody hear me? Yep, great. <laughs> right, well, I have a PowerPoint presentation this afternoon with lots of pictures and so forth. So I will share the screen. And away we go. So <clears throat> this evening's talk, The Mystery of the Handsome Man, um, actually came out of some uh, newspaper research I was doing into uh, 19th century uh, homosexual lives, queer lives, whatever you want to call it. Um, and one of the things that I was doing was searching the National Library's online database of digitised newspapers, Trove, and those of you who are um, history buffs um, will know about Trove and what a great resource it is. But one of the things that, you're, that I was doing was actually trying to uncover uh, 19th century, uh, well, not even queer lives, but instances of queerness and queerdom that were, that were going on. And the way you do this is not to use current terminology, but you get a bit um, inventive with how you actually do your searching. And so you start throwing in words that would have been used in the 19th century to describe the sorts of things I was looking for. So you see here in this article, in these two articles, insulting manner, improper proposal, manner suggesting impropriety, abominable crime. Um, type these in and, you know, you start getting some, some hits. I, I found this particular article in the Bendigo Independent of the 8th of, November, uh, 8th of October, 1897, and it detailed <clears throat> a case uh, in Melbourne of a man who had actually approached a youth on the street in Grattan Street, Carlton, one evening, and uh, thinking he was a rent boy, um, went up to him and quite openly said, hello, are you working? 
Unfortunately, the, rent, the, the, the youth he approached wasn't a rent boy, made a complaint to the police and the man was arrested. Um, so I then started looking for, um, for more information about this article, but it's part of a, a, a larger, um, and I'm just going to change the, um, change the slide. So it was part of a, a larger search that I was looking for because one of, the, well, how do we do queer history is one thing I'd like to explain first. When you're researching the history of a group that was criminalized and marginalized, it's actually quite difficult. And a lot of the resources that are usually available to a researcher, to a historian or a biographer, such as diaries, scrapbooks, letters, um, family photographs, etc., just don't exist for a group like um, homosexual people um, pre, you know, in the 19th century. And that's because um, homosexual acts between men were actually illegal in Victoria up until 1981. And previously at various times, some activities could carry the death penalty or terms of imprisonment up to 10 years. So no one is going to willingly uh, commit to paper evidence of these criminal acts. So a lot of um, a lot of the material that we would otherwise look for when doing research just was never produced in the first place. Or if it was produced, it was destroyed often by the person themselves later on in life or after their death by their families who were trying to straighten up the record, etc. So this makes it difficult. What you end up doing is hunting for other sources of information. So as I said, it's a criminal, there are criminal acts um, between men and that creates criminal trial records and prosecution records, such as criminal trial briefs, which include witness statements for court cases, et cetera, prison registers, which you'll see one there, and a wealth of this sort of prosecutory information and resources and evidence, which is in Victoria is held by the Public Records Office in Melbourne. Now I have to say, same-sex acts between women were never criminalised in Victoria, Australia or Great Britain from when we took our, our legislation. So the same types of material evidence don't exist for lesbian relationships. It's very much a male thing. Now, these uh, prosecutory evidence, the witness statements, etc., give information on where activities are taking place, what's taking place, um, the language that's used, how people describe themselves, how people um, describe what they're up to. Now, of course, it's history as written by the, the authorities. It's always very negative. But sometimes you'll actually get someone's true voice coming through um, in a witness statement. They're, you know, you, you actually can hear them, understand what they're actually saying. Other information that's available are the newspapers, um, which of course, newspapers report the world, but they also set expectations and reinforce standards, if you want, for, for want of a better word. So, and of course, in something like this, it's always very, it's overwhelmingly negative. Um, so you get to you get to read, you get to be very good at reading between the lines. Um, so the tabloid press, particularly uh, Truth newspaper, um, for for one, um, have these very sensationalized articles, which you can actually use again. Um, it's telling you what's going on, where it's happening, how it's described, the language that's used, but also what the wider society's take is on the sort of activity. So that's some of the stuff that we, that we use. And I have to say, Trove has been a godsend for anyone doing uh, newspaper research. So what I found when I went looking for John Lemprier Irvine, this man who had made this approach to the youth in um, Carlton in 1897, was 
one of the most beautifully documented lives of an ordinary Australian. I, I, I use the word ordinary in air quotes. Um, an ordinary Australian. He, because of who he was, and I'll explain that down the track, his family, where he came from, the strata of society he was, the class he was a member of, his life was beautifully documented in newspapers, uh, family records, etc. So it's very unusual to find a 19th century queer man who, who has such a beautifully documented life. And that's because he's actually, he was operating um, a double life, his public persona, which I'll tell you about, tell you about, and also his other secret life. So who was he? Um, I've described him as a, as a champion sportsman, uh, a banker, an entrepreneur, a bon vivant, um, a hail fellow well met, as he was described by some of his uh, friends and colleagues. He was born in Port Arthur, in April 18, 1847, where his father, Charles, was actually second in command of the prison settlement. Uh, he was third of 11 children born to his Irish and Scots parents. So you can already see, you know, dad's second in charge of Port Arthur. He's definitely a member of the establishment. His early life was actually influenced by two matriarchs. His maternal great-grandmother, Jacobina Byrne, who was an Edinburgh widow who emigrated to Van Diemen's Land from Scotland in 1821 when she was already 59. Now, she was the first woman to be granted a land grant in her own name in Tasmania, in Van Diemen's Land. And this is because she was actually a personal friend of Lachlan Macquarie, Governor of New South Wales at the time. She took up uh, property, uh, pastoral property. And among other things I discovered as I was going through this, she was actually instrumental in um, suggesting to Governor Arthur of uh, Van Diemen's Land in the 1820s, the notorious Black Line, whereby uh, colonists attempted to clear Indigenous Tasmanians from the settled areas of the colony by sort of rounding them up. Uh, it was actually a huge failure, a very expensive failure, but um, quite a notorious thing. The other main influence in Irvine's early life was his mother, Jemima Frances Irvine, um, the granddaughter of Jacobina Byrne, a mother of 11 who found time to become a recognised plant collector for Baron Ferdinand von Mueller of the Melbourne Botanic Gardens. And she undertook plant collecting um, expeditions in Western Australia and around uh, Broken Hill as well, right up until the 1890s when she was in her 70s. She actually lived to be 98, dying in 1919. She was also a well-known shell collector and has a couple of uh, shell species actually named after her. Um, and uh, people who collect shells get very excited about Mrs. Mrs. Irvine. Now, so, um, among some of the records that I found, and this is evidence of his beautifully documented life, um, Jemima Irvine kept a scrapbook of family press clippings, etc., which is actually held in the Launceston Public Library. So there you, you start to get some really good family stuff. Also in the Launceston Public Library is a collection of letters between Jemima and her grandmother um, written when uh, their um, Jacobina's letters, Jemima's have been lost, but they're written when Jemima is actually living at Port Arthur and um, describe amongst other things, the actual birth of our man, John Lemprea Irvine in 1847. Um, and they're an amazing resource, which you often don't get when you're doing this sort of research. Now, the family moved to Launceston in 1850 when Charles Irvine, John's father, took up the governorship of the Launceston jail. And he later became a wine and spirit merchant with a long established firm of uh, Irvine and McKechn. And their building is in Brisbane Street, um, uh, Brisbane Street, Launceston is the one circled with the uh, circle there. And young John was educated at a private school for young gentlemen in Launceston. However, 
his father died when he was 16 in November 1863, and Jemima took over running the business, as well as running, you know, looking after 11 children and plant collecting and everything else. So she's obviously a powerhouse. Um, the young John at the age of 17 sat his exams for entry as a clerk to the Union Bank uh, and uh, started working in the bank's uh, new building in Launceston, which is the lower one there. And following Charles's death, Jemima moved the family to a new home on the shores, on the banks of the Tamar River in Launceston, not too far from the jail. But it's here that John and his older brother, Richard, became very interested, very, very involved in rowing, competitive rowing. Um, they were, he was also involved in amateur dramatics, football, exhibiting fancy birds at poultry shows. And these are all activities which gave him press coverage um, in the 1860s and 1870s. But rowing was his first love. Um, you know, outside of, outside of his work. Um, and it has to be said that at the time, in the 19th century, competitive rowing was one of the big four sports. So you've got football, cricket, horse racing, and rowing. And crowds of several thousand, uh, you know, several tens of thousands would actually turn out to actually watch competitive boat races, um, rowing competitions, regattas, etc. Um, so it's, it was a really, you know, it was a very popular sport in Launceston and uh, John was actually quite a good rower. He, he won plenty of competitions and got very involved. In 1874, the bank transferred him to the Victorian, uh, to the Australian mainland, to the colony of Victoria, and he took up a, job, a position at the bank's branch in Ballarat. But he very quickly got involved in the rowing scene in Ballarat um, with the Ballarat City Rowing Club at their sheds at Lake Wendaree. Um, but again, he was obviously the sort of person who actually joined things every time. You know, one of the things that would happen with a bank employee was that would be transferred from branch to branch to branch um, every couple of years. And every time they were transferred, um, if they wanted any hope of social life, they'd actually have to get involved in local um, activities and local um, clubs and societies. So in Ballarat, he, as well as being involved in the Ballarat City Rowing Club, he also was involved in local football clubs. Uh, he was one of a committee that set up a gym um, in 1874. Uh, and he was founding member of a new roller skating club in uh, Ballarat. And this was probably, I think, about the third club, uh, roller skating club in Australia after Sydney and Melbourne. So it's a very new thing. But he was only in Ballarat for a couple of years. The following, uh, in 1875, he transferred to, uh, back to Melbourne um, with the, at the Union Bank's Collins Street branch. And he really got involved in competitive rowing at that stage when he joined the Banks Rowing Club. He was a member of the 1878 Victorian Intercolonial Crew who um, beat the New South Wales team uh, on the lower Yarra. And the, you can see there uh, the, the crowds that are actually turning out to, to watch um, the, the, the race. The following year, he was a member of the, the Victorian um, Eight crew again, uh, traveling to New South Wales to be soundly defeated by New South Wales on the Parramatta River. And there he is there. Now, there are very few actual um, images of him. Uh, the photograph I used on the title slide actually comes from his mother's photograph album, which is held in a private collection in um, Tasmania, and otherwise there are just three um, newspaper uh, line drawings. Um, the 1878 crew, which we saw just um, a moment ago, this 1879 crew, and in 1880, there he is in the, um, towards the rear of the boat, 
Um, again, the, the uh, Victorian crew won against uh, New South Wales uh, in, on the lower Yarra. His professional life in the bank continued. The bank built a new um, offices in Collins Street, Melbourne, and uh, he, he was actually being groomed for managerial um, positions. Now, one thing that we've actually, I did find was actually that the Union Bank later merged with the Bank of Australasia and eventually was subsumed into the ANZ. And the ANZ actually has Union Bank and Bank of Australasia um, staff records, personnel records going back to the 1860s. So I was actually able to find his entire um, uh, professional um, record actually held by the ANZ. And that included um, annual appraisals, just little notes, um, you know, saying how he was getting on. It was obvious he was being groomed for a managerial position. Now, in October 1881, he actually transferred to the Bendigo branch of the um, Union Bank. And Bendigo at the time was in the process of shedding its 1850s gold rush um, sort of persona and becoming, uh, well, it was the third, actually, yeah, third largest city in um, Victoria after Melbourne and Ballarat. Uh, and um, was a, as you can see there, you know, a town that really thought a lot of itself and was going ahead. He transferred to the Union Bank's uh, branch in View Street, which will Bendigo people will know today as Wine Bank um, on View Street, um, where he actually was appointed accountant uh, at the branch. Now, as a three-time former intercolonial rowing champion, he was in demand by the Bendigo rowing clubs. Um, they had two at that time, the Bendigo Rowing Club and the Sandhurst Rowing Club. And my contacts in the rowing uh, fraternity in Bendigo tell me that in the early days, the Bendigo Rowing Club was the Catholic club, the Sandhurst Rowing Club was the Protestant club. Now, being a staunch member of the Church of England and of the establishment, uh, Irvine headed for the Sandhurst Rowing Club. And only, I think he'd only been in town about uh, four weeks before he was actually competing uh, on Lake Waruna in competitions for the Sandhurst Club. Um, he, over the next three years, he rose to become captain of the Sandhurst Club and competed in pretty much every race the club was involved in. And he was instrumental in organizing events, regattas, competitions. Club dinners were always held at the City Family Hotel at Viewpoint. Um, and this was also where they held their, um, their, their committee meetings. And he was also elected to committee of the Sandhurst Football Club, which also held their um, meetings at the City Family. And he was vice president of the Sandhurst Football Club at one stage. Now, he, as I said, he was the sort of person who got involved in everything. And he was a bit of a promoter. Um, and so he was always out to sort of, you know, any, any activity he was involved in, he was out to promote it. Um, and in quite unusual and interesting ways. In October 1882, he was the manager of the electric light, the Grand Illuminated Festival held at Lake Waruna. Um, and the, the ad there says that, uh, you know, there was, uh, the lake will be illuminated from end to end with the electric light of 8,000 candle power. Now, it, these sorts of nighttime electrical exhibi exhibitions were quite popular at the time, ever since uh, football had been played at the MCG under lights in 1879. And that's the picture on the bottom there. So this was, uh, this was touted as a big event and gained a lot of publicity. Three, about th over 3,000 people actually paid, what are they paying? A sh I think adults were a shilling. 3,000 people paid um, to attend the Illuminated Festival. 
and uh, turned up at Lake Waruna for what was promised to be a grand show of lights and fireworks. Uh, but unfortunately, the generator broke down uh, and it couldn't be fixed. And people with tickets were promised that they could come back the next night if the electric light could be got to work. However, it didn't. Um, and it was said that the generator was old and insufficient for the task expected of it. Now, Irvine had made some enemies around town by this stage, probably because he was, you know, he was a very outgoing, gung-ho kind of person. And also, too, he's a Johnny-come-lately bank, bank Johnny who's turned up in town and basically taken over. You know, he's become captain of the rowing club. He's promoting these sorts of events. And so, of course, if something didn't work, um, people who got their noses out of joint would sort of sit back, rub their hands with glee and watch, his, watch, watch him have egg on his face. But so Captain Thomas Sanders of the Bendigo Fire Brigade wrote to the Bendigo Advertiser um, a, few, a few weeks, a few days after the um, Grand Illuminated Festival, uh, accusing the Sandhurst Rowing Club of gulling the citizens of Sandhurst, while another letter writer said that the um, Sandhurst Club and Irvine had proven that, and this is a brilliant quote, it only takes, it only requires a good front, large promises, a defiance of authority, an apology for an electric light, half a dozen pounds of tallow candles with paper lanterns, a few damaged Roman candles, six penny worth of crackers, and the wind can be raised to the tune of 150 pound. Competition between the Sandhurst and Bendigo rowing clubs was fierce. And this writer, who was probably from the um, Bendigo cl um, club, finished his letter by saying, by addressing his fellow members of the BRC, put that in your pipe and smoke it, you drowsy members of the Bendigo Rowing Club. Don't get savage and envious, but profit by the example. So if Sandhurst can do this sort of thing, Bendigo um, Rowing Club can as well. Now, after 18 years with the Union Bank in April 1883, Irvine transferred to the Bank of Australasia's office in Palmel, which is the one there with the star. And, but the bitter rivalry between the rowing clubs was ongoing. And in May 1883, Irvine was embroiled in a controversy about a challenge issued by the Sandhurst Rowing Club to the Bendigo Club to row and a very public spat in the pages of the local press had members of the two clubs exchanging acrimonious and heated words in a very public forum. Irvine was accused of being bombastic in his dealings with the BRC and the controversy definitely made him some more enemies. In December 1883, as the secretary of the All Saints Anglican Choir Library Fund, he was instrumental in organising a soiree musicale at the Masonic Hall in View Street. And this was a decided success. Um, and Irvine was described at the time as the indefatigable secretary of the committee. And um, it was the soiree musicale was actually quite a new thing for Bendigo at the time. Um, the the main hall of the Masonic um, building, which we would know as Capitol Theatre, um, was set out with small tape, not, not in rows of chairs, but in small tables and refreshments were served at the tables. And this was seen as being quite um, a, a sort of exotic thing. Um, <clears throat> around the same time, and it was shortly after um, Irvine was instrumental in the Sandhurst Rowing Club getting its new um, rowing sheds at Lake Waruna. Uh, he was accused of taking the credit for training a Sandhurst crew who won a Melbourne competition. And his detractors said that credit for training a crew should have actually gone to another uh, member of the club, John Godfrey, who'd been long involved with the Sandhurst Club, a founder of the Sandhurst Club. And feeling his position was untenable, uh, Irvine resigned as club captain, uh, but not before inviting Canadian, um, inviting world champion uh, Canadian Ned Hanlon to visit Sandhurst and Eaglehawk in July 1884. And um, Hanlon had a whirlwind two days in the town, rowing on Lake Waruna and Lake Bianga, touring a mine, being hosted at a mayoral reception at the town hall and lunch at the Shamrock Hotel, 
and attending a variety performance at the Royal Princess Theatre in View Street. But less than two weeks after Hanlon's successful visit, Irvine was transferred from the Bendigo office to Melbourne and a farewell dinner was held at the City Family Hotel and friends saw him off on the railway station on the last train. Now, he spent the second half of Melbourne in 18, uh, the second half of the 1880s in Melbourne, becoming a branch manager for the Bank of Australasia at firstly Paran and then St Kilda. Um, and then, and this is, this is where the story starts getting murky. Um, on the night of Saturday, the 11th of February, 1888, he attended a regatta, oh, well, he attended a regatta uh, at Albert Park Lake during the day and that evening attended a rowing club social at Young and Jackson's Hotel in um, Flinders Street. Now, he said he, he'd arrived at about seven o'clock in the evening. He left at about 11. Uh, he said that he'd had one, two glasses of Chablis um, in the entire evening. And as he left, he was actually approached by an 18-year-old youth, John Reardon, who asked him for a match. Uh, now, Irvine gave him the match and the two fell into step walking along Flinders Street. Irvine was living um, in St Kilda at the time and his idea was to walk across to South Melbourne, catch the train home, catch the last train home to St Kilda. Reardon walked along with him. However, what Irvine wasn't aware of was that Reardon was actually in company with four of his mates um, and they were a gang who had worked out quite a clever modus operandi of accosting uh, men in the streets and robbing them. And we'll see how it worked in a moment. So Reardon and uh, Irvine left Young and Jackson's, which is pretty much in the centre of the building, uh, centre of the photograph there, walked along Flinders Street across, across Queen's Bridge and into South Melbourne. They were followed by George Gossip, John Murray, John Holmes, and Gossip's younger brother, Harold. So four of them followed and followed them by a slightly different, and then took a slightly different route until the two groups met up in um, City Road, South Melbourne. There, the gang set upon Irvine, bashed him, robbed him, and said, that if he went to the police, they would actually accuse him of making an improper advance to uh, Sean Reardon. Uh, now, of course, this was a criminal offence, this improper advance. And, but Irvine actually managed to break away from the gang as they were beating him up, rushed along City Road and uh, attracted the attention of two policemen who were walking the beat at the time. The gang followed made the accusation of an improper advance, Irvine was arrested and taken to the South Melbourne Watch House. Um, the, 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 the gang was allowed to go home. The next day, Irvine faced the court and the story of what happened to him made intercolonial um, newspapers as far afield as Sydney and Queensland. Um, he was accused, you know, it was a serious charge against a bank manager. Um, <clears throat> however, the reporting of the case actually brought forward a couple of other victims of the gang who explained that exactly the same thing had happened to them. The gang was then arrested, prosecuted, and uh, ended up in the Melbourne Supreme Court in front of Justice uh, Hartley Williams there in the top left. Uh, and prosecuted by David Gaunson, who was a friend of Irvine's um, and was also instrumental in, uh, he actually also incidentally um, represented Ned Kelly uh, at his last unsuccessful trial um, a, 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 of murder, a charge of murder in 1880. Um, but the four, um, the four, four of the youths, um, George Gossip, John Murray, John Reardon and John Holmes um, were actually found guilty of robbery in company and conspiracy to rob. Now, the fact that they'd beaten Irvine up 
because and accused him of being a, a, a pufta, which was the word that was used in um, gossip's um, witness statement. That wasn't what they were arrested for. They and prosecuted for. They were prosecuted for um, conspiracy to rob, robbery and company. And the tones, the overtone or the undertones of blackmail really concerned respectable Melbourne society at the time. Um, and so the gang were actually sentenced to quite lengthy um, prison terms of up to 20 years. They didn't serve anything like that. Most of them were out within four years, um, but it was actually seen as being a, a real um, blow against what was known as the larrikin menace um, that was gripping Melbourne at the time. Now, looking at the South, the South Melbourne gang um, is a very interesting case because we don't have a lot of information about homosexual men in Melbourne in the late 19th century. Um, and we're never quite sure how much people actually sort of knew about the, the whole issue. But here we have a gang of youths who are very aware of homosexual men living in the city around them. Um, they've actually, they carry out four, um, uh, up to at least four um, robberies where they actually threaten to expose the victim um, to the police if they report the robbery. So they're very aware of what's going on. Now, then we have to think, okay, why did they pick on Irvine? Now, I think the gang knew how to pick their mark, how to pick their targets and how to pick their marks. And we have to say that Irvine, look, there's no evidence that he was homosexual, but well, there's no, you know, it's not written, but there's circumstantial evidence he never married. Uh, he lived in a homosocial world of rowing and, uh, of, and sports. Um, and the boarding houses he lived in were single sex boarding houses. Of course, you know, all boarding houses were at the time, or most were. And in 1884, he actually did share a house for a while with another man, uh, with another um, colleague. Um, and so there's this very homosocial world that he inhabits. And at the time, <clears throat> um, so the gang go to jail and Irvine um, is, uh, is found not guilty and has great sympathy. But at the time, um, there were obviously, um, there's evidence of homosexual men living in Melbourne. On the left there, we have uh, Edward Feeney and Charles Marx, who in 1874, engaged in a quite bizarre um, double suicide pact in the Treasury Gardens. Um, they had photographs taken um, of each other at a Burke Street photographer's studio before going off to the park, where, whereupon they drew guns on each other and shot each other. However, Mark's gun, now Mark's is on the right there of that photograph, Mark's gun didn't go off, Feeney's did. So Feeney shot Mark's, and was then arrested and hanged for his murder. Um, in 1888, uh, we have there the same year that Irvine was beaten up by the South Melbourne gang. We have a, a character called Gordon Lawrence, who his um, charge sheet there reads, he was arrested for being idle and disorderly and received six months imprisonment for it. Now, he his um, claim to fame is actually that he was found perambulating the aisles of the exhibition building at, uh, in Carlton Gardens, dressed in full drag. And initially the police arrested him because they thought he was a female prostitute um, trawling for trade in the exhibition buildings. When they grabbed him and knocked his wig off, they, dis they discovered that, he, that she was a he. Um, so there's evidence of um, homosexual people in Melbourne in the 19th century. And there are also, there's also evidence of homosexual meeting places. There's no gay life as we would know it today. There are no pubs, there are no cafes, etc. But there are parks, there are secluded parks, there are baths and Turkish baths where men would meet other men who are interested in men. And 
The streets of the city are also referenced quite often in um, criminal trial um, um, evidence as being meeting places and pick up places. Um, and so, you know, places like the block there in Collins Street, the photographs on that on the screen there um, were known as being um, haunts in the, well, right back to the 1880s. So following um, his running with the South Melbourne mob and then being sent to jail, Irvine continued with the Bank of Australasia and also got very involved in the social life of boom, Boomtime Melbourne. One of his sisters actually married a uh, pastoralist, uh, Harvey Patterson, who ended up becoming one of the founding um, chairman of BHP. And uh, they entertained quite often at their house in Ackland Street, St Kilda, with their ballroom that um, accommodated 300 dancers and had five acres of garden. And Irvine, living in St Kilda, very near to his sister, was often uh, present at these sorts of parties. He left the bank in 1893, setting up business as a um, legal and general manager for um, gold mining companies and uh, smaller, smaller exploration companies and had offices in some of the big skyscrapers that were being built at the bottom end of Queen Street there in Melbourne um, in the 18, early 18, late 1880s, early 1890s. And particularly he was involved in mining and um, traveled quite extensively around, um, particularly the high country around Bright, and um, Harrietville, et cetera, looking, um, supporting those companies that he was actually help, uh, managing. Uh, he took time in the 1890s to travel. In, the, in Easter 1890, he did a little trip down the east coast of Tasmania and revisited the place of his birth at Port Arthur. And in 1893, made it as far afield as um, New Zealand. And again, this, this information has come from newspapers. It's, it's, he's, he's listed on shipping records. Um, he's listed in reports about particular excursion trips, all of his business dealings. He's uh, are listed in the newspaper. He advertises in the newspapers. He's, he's all over the place. But um, coming back to where we came in, in, eight, in October, uh, September 1897, um, he was in um, Grattan Street, um, Carlton, one um, Monday evening. Why? We don't know. But he made an approach to a 19-year-old youth called Ernest Smith, said, hello, are you working? Smith made a complaint to the police and Irvine ended up um, being arrested and fronting the magistrate's court. Now, this is the second time he's actually being involved with the police for this sort of um, activity. So he's, um, he, he, again, as in 1888, he's actually um, found to be, have no case to answer for and he's released. Um, but this is, this is the particularly interesting thing. The Bendigo Independent um, picks up not just on the 1897 case, which they report under the heading of an unfortunate gentleman, but they actually draw the connection to the 1888 case where he's beaten up by the larrikins and accused of abominable offences, twice arrested on shameful allegations. Now, what happened then, of course, is that, uh, you know, mud sticks and within a week, Irvine's life collapsed. Now he had found had to have no case to answer for um, in, the, in the case, the um, magistrates chose not to tr um, believe Ernest Smith's uh, testimony, but trial by newspaper meant that he faced social um, ostracism, social disgrace, professional ruin. Um, within a week, every company that he actually um, operated as manager of, um, cut ties with him. And the, the newspapers of, of October 1897 
um, are full of ads saying that, you know, such and such a company has a new manager because Mr. Irvine's resigned. Um, so he was still, he left Melbourne in disgrace, uh, went home to the family in Launceston. They were apparently still speaking with him because on the afternoon of the 30th of November, 1898, so 12 months after his um, uh, arrest in um, Carlton, he attended the Lady Mayoress's um, afternoon reception at the Albert Hall in Launceston in company with two of his brothers and their wives. Um, and then at the end of the afternoon, walked out the door and disappeared. And what happened to him after that, we do not know. Um, I'm thinking, I think what happened was that obviously he wanted to disappear. Um, he's a member of an establishment family with a very well-documented life. He, you know, his life for 50 years is documented almost week by week in the newspapers. Um, he's a former rowing champion. Um, for years afterwards, into the 1920s, um, whenever they do a, a retrospective on rowing in the 1880s, his name is mentioned, but nobody knows what happened to him, even, you know, in the, 18, in the 1920s. Um, they're not sure if he's alive or dead or, or what. Um, so the, that, that a member of an establishment family with a well-documented life and a public figure, um, in, albeit in a minor way, manages to disappear, I think could only be that he decided to disappear. And it would have been easy to do. He could have um, just left, gone to another colony, headed overseas. Um, he could have gone to the UK, South Africa, Canada, the US, wherever. Um, quite easily assume another name and a new life. So we just don't know what happened to him. Um, interestingly, I was in a, uh, in a conversation um, as part of a launch of the book um, last week, and some of the um, ideas that the audience threw at me as, you know, what might have happened was uh, ranged from, you know, the family paying him to stay away to him being the victim of an honour killing um, and uh, uh, taken out by his family. I don't believe that at all. I do not believe that at all. But it's a very interesting case that a very prominent person could actually just disappear almost completely. And that's why I've actually said he very much is a lost 19th century life. And that brings me to the end of um, my presentation. I hope I haven't gone too far over. That's great. Thank you so much, Wayne. Um, I was absolutely fascinated by that story. <laughs> it's just such a um, historian's sort of joy to see that kind of um, the sources that you're able to find, the detail about his life that you're able to find um, was just amazing. And as you say, not just, but not just in Trove. Trove is amazing for the newspapers, but also just how you're able to track track the details of his life so that's fantastic so yes do take note of the uh, details of Wayne's book and um, yeah I'll, I'll keep my eyes on the chat if people want to um, put in questions um, or comments as well um, and you can also yeah we as Jordy says it's best if you can type your message in the chat and I can read it out for you um, Right, we've got a um, comment from, um, I think it's okay to say first name, from Mark. Um, yeah, thanks, Ray. Magnificent presentation. I like how your story took us on different journeys. Yeah, would you keep searching for Irvine? And if he was one of your dinner guests, what would you say to him? Great question. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a very interesting, um, yes. Oh, what would I say to him? Um, <laughs> Well, well, firstly, uh, will I keep searching for him? Uh, yes, if I can. Uh, I, I, I do know that he did not die in Australia under his own name because I've, I've tracked that. But then, you know, the case is if he did go overseas, where did he go? Um, if he did stay in Australia under an assumed name, how would you ever find that, know what that assumed name was? Um, death certificates are only as good as the information 
provided by the person who's filling it in. So if he went to Brisbane and died in a boarding house under the name of Smith and the boarding house um, keeper filled in the death certificate, um, you know, he'd just be Mr. Smith. Um, and so really hard to track. Um, I would, what, what would I say to him if as a dinner party guest? God, I'd, so many questions, so many questions. Um, I'd probably get him to sing a song because he was renowned for, you know, standing up at rowing club socials and singing. Um, so that's often uh, spoken of. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I think the main question I'd be asking is, what happened? Where did you go? And what happened afterwards? Yeah. You've, you've made me think of, a, of the new technology, Wayne, about the um, mm. sort of facial recognition work that people are doing with photographs, but you've just got the one photograph, but someone like, um, I think it's Tim Sherritt, you can just imagine now with the power of computers to troll the newspapers. Because I feel like he's the sort of person that might not have kind of just disappeared that he probably maybe wouldn't have been able to help himself from being that organizing person. <laughs> yeah, sure yeah. Completely yeah. away. I mean, I, I did I did search for other John Irvines in newspapers, and of course there are quite a lot. And mm. he, uh, but you know they're not him. Their life stories don't match up with him. Confusingly, there is another John Irvine who was a rowing champion in South Australia um, around 1900, but he was a much younger man who actually. Um, you know, his life was fairly well documented as well. So, um, yeah, I had, I had a few, um, you know, interesting possibilities that seem to go nowhere, unfortunately. Yeah, thanks, Wayne. And, and Teresa has said how much um, she enjoyed the mystery, including the photos, um, learning about the rowing, can't wait for the sequel, and also commented about the, yeah, the amazing stories about the interesting and very strong women, like those women mm. were... Yeah. Amazing. Um, yeah, his 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 mother, um, Jemima Irvine, deserves a book all of her own. Um, she was truly an amazing person. Um, his his great granny, um, Jacobina Byrne, to you know, emigrate to to Van Diemen's Land at the age of fifty eight, take up land fifty miles from Long, uh, from Hobart in eighteen twenty one, and. Um, uh, just um, and it was said at the time that uh, you know she was on her own with a gang of convicts with convict workers. Um, she went off into the into the bush with with her con convict gang of workers and um, ba basically just you know chopped this property out of the out of the forest. Um, just an absolutely very um, you know very interesting very interesting. Mm. And also too I you know. As I, as I kept researching, it just, you know, I was actually struck by who didn't these people know? You know, one of his nieces married a rear admiral and was friends with, with uh, Nellie Melba. And there's, there's um, you know, there's a, um, a hat pin box um, donated to the Art Gallery of New South Wales by Irvine's niece, um, which had belonged to Nellie Melba. And um, you know, you're doing this, and you think, who didn't these people know? You know, this, so the connections are just amazing. Yeah, that sense of that colonial society at that time and the interconnections of that. Um, we've got a couple of more comments. Uh, Stephen's got a, it's a very interesting. I've got one dark thought. Did anyone fall into Cataract Gorge at about that time? <laughs> that have been a face. <laughs> There's another trove search coming up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, and yeah, Jody was wondering something similar um, about what might have happened. <laughs> I mean, I've I've done more, most of my work has always been sort of around a lot of women's history, and, and there's a lot of work around single women. And you mentioned about I was just wondering what is the context around single men? What would be the attitudes towards single men at that time of that, especially as you was getting older? Um, I don't know much about it. I've never done mm. any research on wider attitudes to single men at that time. Yeah. Um well, the expectation, the, the social expectation is that eventually you would get married. I mean, mm. people, people, particularly the middle classes, tended to marry later in the 19th century because the expectation was that you wouldn't marry until you were well enough established that you could actually support a, a, a family. Um, and so men tended to marry in their late 20s, early 30s. Um, but so there was, a, but so there's an expectation that eventually you would get married. 
and particularly um, working for the bank um, as a bank manager, the expectation would be that the bank manager would eventually be married. Um, in smaller towns, in, in country towns and rural towns, the bank manager was one of the leaders of local society. And so, you know, it was expected that he would have a wife who would, you know, help him maintain that position. Um, so someone has suggested to me that maybe one of the reasons he left the Bank of Australasia in 1893 was perhaps, you know, he was getting too old to be a single man mm. um, and the bank was starting to wonder, you know, when are you going to get married? Because um, the banks did exert, you know, employers um, generally exerted quite a lot of um, influence and pressure on their, on their staff, but the banks particularly. Um, the, uh, the, the, the way he was being groomed for a managerial position um, is actually evident in his um, annual appraisals. Uh, you know, and, and they all say, you know, he's well thought of in the district, he's a good officer, he's, you know, he's a valuable um, employee, but, uh, you know, 1893, he's 46, and why isn't he married? Um, so, yeah, it's quite possible that that was one of the reasons he, he actually did leave the bank at that stage. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. Thanks. I'm just checking if other questions come through. Ben wants to need to read anything out. Um, I mean, I, I did think that the work history that you had was pretty amazing too. The, the find of the business archives of the employee records too, of that detail. It's just so exciting <laughs> as a yes, historian. Yes, it's just dream yes. of that kind of find. <laughs> um, and that was, that was completely serendipitous. Um, you know, but, uh, it was just amazing to find find that. But then also, you know, the the, the letters between his um, great grandmother and his mother, um, dating back to the early eighteen forties, um, and Jacobina Byrne comes across as a very, um, you know, a very personable um, old lady. She's she's very interested in everything, and she's got lots of good advice to to give to her granddaughter about you know having her own money and employing servants and, uh, you know, they go off to live in a convict settlement and, you know, Jacobine is very concerned that the family doesn't have um, milk and vegetables and fruit and so forth to, to, to eat in this, in this convict settlement. Um, and then says, you know, but surely you'd be allowed to have poultry. Um, and so it's, yeah, brilliant, brilliant series of, of letters. It's, it's just amazing the, the, documentary evidence that that um, I was able to find. Yeah, it's such a rich, rich story. And, and Geordie has said the library will be buying a copy of your book if uh, mm -hmm. you haven't found it already. But we also just got a couple of questions. I think, Geordie, this is probably one for you. When will the recording um, be available for people to watch again? Um, hopefully I'll have it uploaded by tomorrow afternoon. I'll Speedy. see how I go, yeah. That'd be great. And yeah, and this is so we'd be really interesting. Thanks, Wayne. I really hope we find out what happened to him. And are any of his family still alive? Um, <clears throat> there are, there are, um, yes, I was able to actually trace some family down. Not, I wasn't able to actually get any of them on board for the, for the project, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, but I was able to track down um, a couple of a couple of family members, um, and they've they've, they've scattered um, far and wide as well. I mean, there were eleven children in the family. I think uh, nine of them uh, survived to adulthood, right. um, and they ended up in um, Western Australia, South Australia, Sydney, um, and scattered just scattered throughout northern Tasmania. Um, so. And uh, each one of them had a very interesting story, but we don't have time to go into that now. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the next uh, season of papers. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's fantastic. Yeah, really, when you mentioned his sister at the end, it's like, yeah, actually, he had, he had this really big family as well. Um, mm. Mm. Just had a comment. Yeah, Virginia's just saying, thanks. They've got to dash to another, another Zoom, but terrific research, oh. and a grand story. Um, and Geordie also has put our YouTube channel link, which is great. Um, it, we are at half past six, so I should really be wrapping up. I'd like to thank Wayne for just really rich, wonderful story. Great presentation, and I'm sure it's a fantastic book. Um,
rush out and buy it, everybody. And also to publicize our next uh, Discovering History paper. Uh, this will be on the 14th of October. I cannot predict whether this will be Zoom uh, or uh, any options of life, but 14th of October, we will be back here by hook or by crook. And that is um, a paper by the Nagurai Ilum Wurrung Elder, Uncle Vin Peters and Tony Ford. And the paper will be called The Forgotten People, the Nagurai Ilum Wurrung People. So thank you very much, everybody, and take care of yourselves. Thanks.